Okay, and we are, we are on. Uh, so the nervous system, this is gonna be an introduction to what the nervous system is, what it does, and beginning talking about the cell types that are found in neural tissue. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just quickly explain the overall functioning of the nervous system, how it works. And if you can grasp this, it will really help with your understanding later in this discussion, days later when we start talking about different divisions, especially, uh, especially the autonomic nervous system. So I'm just gonna draw a quick map here on my screen. Um, and I'm gonna begin down here in my lower left-hand corner, and I'm just gonna write the word sensory. This is sort of how the nervous system works as a whole. It's an overall pathway or map of transmission. So the nervous system largely is just in charge of, is responsible for regulating short-term body actions. Almost everything that occurs in real time um, is, is regulated by the nervous system. So, and how the nervous system works is sensory receptors, so I'm gonna put in parentheses here, these are part of the nervous system and they are located sort of on the external <clears throat> part of our body as well as internal. And they sense changes in the environment, either in our external environment or our internal environment inside of us. And we call this the afferent division. So I'm gonna write that word. If you hear me say afferent, um, the correct pronunciation is afferent. Sometimes I say afferent because the, when I was in your seat as a student, the, and I took neurobiology, the instructor always said afferent, so that kind of got tattooed on my brain. Anyway, so sensory receptors, they sense a change in the environment and they send signals to our central nervous system but these sensory receptors and the nerves that are taking signals toward the central nervous system are part of the peripheral nervous system. So I'm just gonna write PNS, and I'll, I'll talk more about central versus peripheral after I draw this map. So the direction of flow goes like this, and the destination of sensory information or sensory input is the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. So sensory information is picked up by receptors sent to the central nervous system. The central nervous system's function is called integration, which just means processing of information. So the central nervous system receives these impulses, and then the central nervous system makes sense out of those impulses and decides what to do about it. And after the central nervous system decides what to do about it, the CNS sends out a response to this change that the sensory receptors have sensed. So I'm gonna draw an arrow going back out through the peripheral nervous system this way. And on this first arrow, I'm just gonna write motor. Sensory input always goes toward the central nervous system. Motor output always goes away from the central nervous system. And we call this motor output division the efferent, you'll hear me sometimes say efferent, the efferent division is the motor output. <clears throat> now this motor output so I'm gonna rewrite this over here just to remind you this is a motor output. It can do several things. 
it can go to what is called the somatic subdivision. And that sends signals specifically to our voluntary skeletal muscles. That's supposed to say voluntary. <clears throat> or the motor signals, the motor output can go through a subdivision called the autonomic nervous system. A U T O auto N O M I C autonomic. That means self governing. Just think of it as automatic. We don't have voluntary control over that. So autonomic goes to things like smooth muscle organs, smooth muscle of organs, and also glands. And to, to make things worse, to make things even more complicated, there are subdivisions to the autonomic nervous system. There's two subdivisions to this called sympathetic. You've probably heard these words, sympathetic and parasympathetic. I'm going to give you some real life examples now of how this how this all is put together. That's supposed to say parasympathetic. I'm running out of space. All right, now I'm going to give you some real life examples. Let's just say you stick your finger on a hot stove. A classic example of how the nervous system works. There are somatic receptors. Somatic just means the outside, in this case, means outside world. So I'm going to write, there are somatic and visceral receptors. Somatic receptors sense changes in the external environment. Visceral receptors sense changes on the inside of us, the internal environment. So let's just start with this. Put your finger on a hot stove. Sensory receptors in your finger sense heat and they send an, a signal via the nervous system, which is part of this peripheral nervous system, to the brain. And your brain says, ah, heat. If, if we keep the finger on the hot stove, we will incur tissue damage. So your brain then sends a signal outbound via the motor efferent peripheral nervous system to somatic voluntary skeletal muscles in your arm and hand to quickly pull your finger away from the stove. And that we've all put our fingers on something that's too hot, that's burned our fingers. And so all that whole pathway that I just described, starting here, going this way, up here, and back out, occurs in a matter of milliseconds. That's how quickly the nervous system can work. Now let's do another example. Let's say that you just ate breakfast and there's food arriving in your stomach. There are visceral sensory receptors in the wall of your stomach that sense food in the stomach either from stretching the stomach wall or from a change in the pH in the stomach. And those sensory receptors, guess what? They send an impulse to the central nervous system. In this case, it goes to the brain stem. And the central nervous system, the brain stem says, ah, there's food in the stomach. Let's do something about that. And then so the central nervous system sends a signal out the motor efferent division this direction to the autonomic division of the motor efferent and it sends signals to glands in the stomach to start start secreting <clears throat> hydrochloric acid to digest that food that's the parasympathetic subdivision of the autonomic nervous system because the parasympathetic division is what's sort of regulating our day-to-day -day resting and digesting. This subdivision is reserved 
for when we are stressed out. It's a survival mechanism, okay? Organs also are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, it's not only organs that are sympathetic. Glands and organs are both sympathetic and parasympathetic, by the way. So that's generally how the nervous system works. Sensory input goes to the central nervous system. Central nervous system processes that information. It's called integration. Sends out a signal to do something about this original sense and change. All right, let's later on and move on. Um, now I'm gonna to try to go in the order of your book and so now you understand the three functional elements, that's supposed to be two words, three functional elements to the nervous system. We've got first sensory input, and hopefully that little diagram I just drew will help you with that, and that's coming from sensory receptors going toward the central nervous system. We've got integration. We're using these functional words now, not anatomical words. Integration, which is processing of sensory input by the central nervous system and then issuing a command. And finally, there is motor output. And that is sending the signal the response of the command to an effector organ. That just means to muscles or glands. Okay, so that's how the nervous system works. Now, anatomically, and I'll, I'll load on a little bit of physiology here, but anatomically, you know the divisions now, we have central nervous system. So I'm just gonna write, I'll write that out. From, from this point on though, I'm just gonna write CNS. So the central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord. And you know now that's for processing information. Integration, it's what we call the control center. It interprets sensory input and then sort of dictates motor output. And we also have the peripheral nervous system. And I'll abbreviate that from this point forward, the PNS. And that's basically everything outside of the central nervous system. And if that, that, what that means in real life, it's just, it's nerves emanating from the spinal cord. So I'm just going to write nerves from spinal cord. There are also cranial nerves up in the brain that are considered part of the CNS, but by and large, we will mostly be talking about the peripheral nervous system of nerves emanating from the spinal cord. <clears throat> now, within this peripheral nervous system, I just need to call up a new whiteboard because I'm going to say a few more things about it. So this is actually PNS continued. <clears throat> and there's two, you know this now, functional subdivisions. They were on my first board. I'm gonna say a few more detailed things about it. So you know the peripheral nervous system is basically linked to the central nervous system. One incoming, one outgoing. So I'm going to write first sensory afferent division. 
those two words will always go hand in hand, sensory and afferent. Afferent. This conducts impulses toward the central nervous system, that's first and foremost. And there's somatic sensory fibers and these fibers are from the skin skeletal muscles and joints I always think of this as they sense sort of the, our external environment. And then there are visceral sensory fibers. These sort of monitor the inside world. These sort of monitor our external environment. So visceral sensory fibers, um, you can just write they're from visceral organs. Things like the heart, vessels, digestive organs, things inside of our body. So we've got a sensory afferent division and a motor afferent. So I'm just writing out in more detail what I said on that first diagram. These carry motor impulses away from the central nervous system. They carry the commands to effector organs. And there are, there is, uh, we labeled a somatic motor division. The somatic, sometimes books say somatic nervous system. This is all part of the nervous system and it's language that gets confusing, um, in my opinion. I like to, to use the words division because then it tells you it's a division or subdivision of the entire nervous system. But sometimes your book will just say the somatic nervous system. Same thing. It's from the central nervous system to skeletal muscles. So I'm just going to write from... CNS. To skeletal muscles. And finally, there's the autonomic nervous system or division. I'm just going to write the autonomic NS. This is from the central nervous system to smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. To smooth cardiac muscle and glands and then there are even further subdivisions of the autonomic I know it's crazy complicated um, so I'm going to use a one again there's one sympathetic that's our survival mechanism and two parasympathetic which just means daily maintenance it's called the rest and digest division all right so there is an outline of the entire nervous system both in our original picture form here which will help you understand the functionality and all of the language if you can grasp this little diagram and then this is just these next two uh, whiteboards, these next two pages are just a breakdown of, of what we did pictorially in the first one. All right, now let's go on to nervous tissue and cell types. I think your book might say nervous tissue, I'm not sure. I'm just gonna write cell types.
in the nervous system. Two main categories. Neurons and neuroglia. These neurons, I'll talk about more specifically in a minute, are the money cells. These are what actually generate and conduct electrical impulses. This is a whole group, neuroglia is a whole group of cells that are just helper cells. We'll look at them individually, but as a group, just think of these as helper cells. They do not conduct electrical impulses. Okay, so let's just look at the, um, the neuroglia in detail first because that's the order your book goes, and then we'll talk about neurons to finish up the lecture. So because I have some space here, I'm just gonna write neuroglia. Sometimes uh, books will call them glial cells. It means the same thing. These are the support cells, and there are six types overall. Four in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. I'll talk about those first. So I'm going to number these, one, two, three, four. And the first, I'll go in the order of your book. The first type of neuroglia that's covered in your book are called astrocytes. They get their name, by the way, just because they look, they're sort of star-shaped or spiky-shaped. That's why they were originally called astrocytes. These are the most abundant neuroglia. So I'm just gonna write most common in the human body, most common type. They have all sorts of functions. I'll try to be brief. They physically support and physically anchor neurons to so, so that neurons aren't just floating around in fluid or space. They support and anchor neurons to some sort of substrate. They also help form synapses. We'll look at synapses in detail later. That just means a junction between one cell and another cell. Uh, a neuron and another cell. So they help form the synapses. Structurally, they help form a synapse. They recapture lost potassium ions. And you'll see that'll make more sense later in our nervous system discussion. <clears throat> I'm going to list a few more functions here. They help maintain something called the blood-brain barrier. That's a physical barrier that helps keep some constituents in our bloodstream away from our brain. We don't, if we have bacteria, for example, or bad things, microorganisms circulating around in our blood, which happens sometimes, we try to prevent, our body tries to prevent those things from getting, reaching the brain for obvious reasons. A um, couple more functions for these, and this is, this is the worst one, by the way, in terms of uh, the, the, fun, the number of functions. They also recycle debris and neurotransmitter. So I'm gonna write recycle neurotransmitter. That is, you know now, that is the chemical that's released by nerve cells, neurons. They recycle, and they, they also participate in information processing in the brain. Um, but I'm gonna say this, they have the ability, astrocytes, these glial cells, have the ability to actually communicate with each other through calcium pulses or waves. <clears throat> 
that's the worst one. Let's move on to the next one, which I believe are microglial cells. So if you need me to come back to this, just ask and I will. So the second type of neuroglia in the central nervous system They get their name just because they're small. They're smaller than astrocytes. They, al they also have thorny processes on them. Um, they're not quite as star-shaped as astrocyte astrocytes, but they have uh, thorny processes all around their surface. Their main functions are, I'm writing, they phagocytize. That means gobble up or eat microorganisms. So should bad things get into, through, or past the blood-brain barrier, these cells act like immune cells. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. They act like immune cells of the central nervous system. <clears throat> they also digest, because they're phagocytic cells, that means they have the ability to ingest and digest other things. They also digest old neuron debris. <clears throat> All right, let's go on to number three. On the list, these are ependymal cells. Remember, all four of these are found only in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. These sort of reside or live in central cavities of the brain. <clears throat> and spinal cord. They have these sort of an ependymal cell uh, on their edges. They sort of have these flagella or cilia-like extensions, here, here would be the nucleus, and if they're lining a cavity of, of the brain or spinal cord and there's fluid on this side, what these little extensions do is they beat back and forth and they help circulate cerebrospinal fluid. All right, last one in the central nervous system, and then there's just two in the peripheral nervous system. Oligo, it's a long word, it's a funny word. Oligo dendrocytes. These things produce a myelin sheath <clears throat> around nerve fibers in the central nervous system. Um, nerve fiber, that just means a long process, an axon. So nerve fibers in the CNS. <clears throat> We're gonna, I'm gonna talk about this as a separate discussion, but it, think of it right now as just a covering, a protective covering around nerve fibers. So those are one, two, three, four in the central nervous system. I'm gonna quickly do the two in the peripheral nervous system. Remember, we're still talking about helper cells, neuroglial cells. And there's two in the peripheral nervous system, the first one, called satellite cells. These are sort of like astrocytes. Of the central nervous system functionally. That means they function, they surround neuron cell bodies and they give structural support, help form synapses. So they have similar functions. 
I'm not going to relist all of them. To astrocytes in the CNS. And finally, the last neuroglial cell are Schwann cells. It's S C H W A N N. These function like the oligodendrocytes. They're not exactly identical, but they have similar features and functions. And so these, I'll write this out, they form myelin around fibers in the peripheral nervous system. These are lipid-based, actually glycolipids, but lipid protein-based and they literally wrap around nerve fibers. I'll talk more extensively about that in a moment. So those are all the neuroglial cells, four in the central nervous system, two in the peripheral. <clears throat> now I'm gonna talk about the money cells, the neurons. This, most of our discussion now from this point forward in the nervous system, much of it will surround just talking about the function of these types of cells. We're not gonna say a whole lot about those neuroglial cells after this point. You know that their big function is that they um, generate and transmit electrical impulses. We're going to spend the rest of this lecture just talking about these cells. First, there are specific characteristics of neurons that make them a little bit unique to other cells in the human body, other than the electricity part. They have a very long lifespan. So they live for a super long time. And characteristic number two is related to that. They are a mitotic. That means there is no cellular division. There are not stem cells giving rise to new nerve cells in our body. You've probably perhaps heard the expression, once you kill a brain cell, you're never getting it back. And that's pretty much true. Um, nerve tissue in general has very little to no regenerative capabilities. So we, we make no new nerve cells throughout our life, That's which makes number one very important. They have a very long lifespan. And finally, Characteristic number three, I'm just going to list, they have a very high metabolism, very high metabolic rate. They need constant energy. Oops, in my eraser. I'm gonna put they need constant oxygen and an energy supply like glucose in order to function. Without almost constant oxygen and energy, they die very quickly. So if they do have a, a constant supply of oxygen and glucose, they live very long. But without that, if, this, if O2 is cut off or an energy supply is cut, cut off, they, they die very quickly. Um, that's why we, we breathe constantly, 24 hours a day. And that's also why we carry um, energy in the form of stored lipids, stored fat, adipose tissue, is because our central nervous system in particular, our, our large brains compared to other animals, 
is in, is constantly demanding oxygen and an energy source in order to function. Now let's look at the anatomy. I, I'm going to call up a new page because I'm going to draw a big picture of a neuron. I'm going to mostly speak about these structures as I draw them. A typical, I'm going to draw a typical motor neuron. There are all different types of neurons um, and shapes in the human body, but motor neurons are multipolar. And I'll draw this every time we have a lecture. So you'll get very used to this, this picture and seeing this picture. So what I'm drawing here is a, a textbook looking picture of a motor neuron. But remember, a motor neuron is part of the peripheral nervous system that carries impulses away from the central nervous system toward an effector organ like a muscle or a gland. And we're gonna look anatomically at just the parts and the pieces. First, this large section here is called the neuron cell body. I drew a nucleus in the center of it. So I'll label that nucleus. This neuron cell body region, I'm gonna highlight it in yellow just for fun, is, is also called the soma. So S-O-M-A refers to just the neuron cell body and all of its constituents, what's inside of it. <clears throat> These little tiny branches off of the soma or cell body these little thin ones that I've drawn are called dendrites. I don't use the, and your textbook doesn't use the word branch. I use that because you're familiar with that. Technically, these are called processes, okay? So when you hear me say a, a process, a neuron cell process, or processes, it just means branch. So these little thin processes are called dendrites. Together with the soma, this is the receiving part of the neuron. I'm just writing receive signals. So both the dendrites and the wall of the soma where I, that I've drawn in yellow have the ability to receive signals. So I'm gonna just highlight some of these as yellow. So the receiving end of the nerve cell, the neuron, is down here at the soma end. Okay. <clears throat> now the cell has typical organelles, like, like most cells in the human body. So even more so in some cases. So I'm not going to draw all of these things, but inside of the cell, there's things like mitochondria, lots of mitochondria. There's endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, all ribosomes everywhere because neurons in general are unusually high in metabolism at making things, making proteins and making chemicals called neurotransmitters. So Let's just label some more of these parts. This one big, huge, long process here is called the axon, A-X-O-N. And that transmits impulses away from the cell body. So dendrites and soma receive signals. The axon sends electrical impulses, I'm just gonna write signals, away from the soma, only in this direction. <clears throat> this area of the axon, that's this 
sort of tree trunk area, the bulging area, is called the axon hillock. And that is the area where the electrical impulse that the axon sends is first generated. So I'm going to write generates an action potential, which is just a fancy way of saying electrical impulse. Okay. And it moves only in this direction. So all nerve cells, no matter what type, have one single axon associated with them. But nerve cells can have one or many dendrites. So this cell, obviously, that I've drawn has many dendrites attached to the soma end of, of the neuron. It is possible for a nerve cell to have one dendrite and one axon, but always one axon. and one or more dendrites, depending on the nerve cell and where it's located. So remember, inside we've got rough endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, ribosomes. <clears throat> remember that the soma and dendrites act as the receiving end. We've got axon that generates, propagates an action potential or electrical impulse sending away from the cell body. The axon hillock, this thick portion of the axon closest to the soma, is where the action potential is actually started or generated. There are things, I'm not gonna mess up my drawing, there are branches off of the axon, sometimes called axon collaterals, and those can come off at right angles off of the axon sort of like this, in different areas. I just want to go over some of this language with you, that's all. Now down here at this end, these are called axon branches. And these little buttons, these little circular things are called axon terminals. We mentioned those in the neuromuscular junction. I, some, believe it or not, some neurons can have thousands of axon branches and terminals at the end. Obviously, I can't draw all of those. Those terminals, they store and release neurotransmitter. That's their function. Finally, the last bit of language on this drawing that I'm going to write, just in case you hear me say this, the axolemma is just the plasma membrane, this membrane of the axon, okay? The reason that I'm highlighting that is the electrical impulse actually travels down the axon lemma like this. All right, there's basic anatomy on a neuron. I'm just going to talk about the myelin sheath next. So let's call up a new board. I'm going to quickly draw this, but I'm not going to label everything again. This is a typical motor neuron. And let's talk about the myelin sheath. Since, since this is a motor neuron, we now know it resides in the peripheral nervous system. Okay. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath is made up of Schwann cells. That's what makes my, this. I'm going to say quite a few things about the myelin sheath. In the peripheral nervous system, it's made from Schwann cells. Remember, in the central nervous system, it's oligodendrocytes. Okay, and let's just do this around our motor neuron. Cells, Schwann cells, wrap around the axon like 
toilet paper around a, a roll or paper towels around a roll. So if this is a cross section of the axon up here, a Schwann cell literally wraps around it, spirals around it, forming this encasement. And that occurs, the encasement occurs like this. There are gaps between those wrapping Schwann cells like this. This whole thing is called the myelin sheath the wrapping, that insulation that we've put around <clears throat> this axon. Now, this myelin sheath, we know that the Schwann cells are lipid-based, so they're fat-based cells. And this lipid-based this lipid-based cell provides for really good insulation. Um, so they don't have a lot of protein. What this means is, and I'm not going to test you on this part, they don't have a lot of proteins on their surface, and that makes them great insulators because a lot of things can't move in and out of those cells very well at all. So here's their basic functions. They protect. Insulate. <clears throat> and here's a big one increase, so I drew an arrow up, increase the speed of transmission of the signals, of the electrical signals. So I'm going to write of the action potential. So if this, it's not always present on all neurons, this myelin sheath, but when it is, it wraps around the axon, electrically insulates it, protects it, and speeds up the transmission of the electrical impulse. I'll explain how it does that later. Dendrites are always unmyelinated. So, Dendrites are always unmyelinated. Axons may have myelin, some don't. They don't always have myelin. The thickness of this myelin sheath depends on how many spirals or wraps the Schwann cells do. <clears throat> These little spaces, I'll highlight them in blue right here. They're called gaps in the myelin sheath, and they have names. They're called the nodes of Ranvier. They're just named after the French guy who discovered them. These are gaps in the myelin sheath, and they occur at very regular intervals. I'll explain the significance of those later as well. Now, I've drawn a motor neuron, and so there, these would be Schwann cells wrapping this, this uh, motor, this efferent motor neuron. Oligodendrocytes are the type of cell that basically does the same thing in the central nervous system. They can coil around up to 60 different neurons at a time. So they, they behave a little bit differently than Schwann cells. Oligodendrocytes, uh, more ooze around the central nervous system, coating the, the fibers, the axons of central nervous system neurons. So I'm going to go to a new whiteboard and define these two terms. In the central nervous system, there are places called white matter. You've probably heard this before and gray matter. Now you'll know what this means. White matter refers to things that have myelin on the myelinated neural tracts. And they're called white matter because when we look at them with our eyes, that tissue looks white. 
that fatty lipid tissue of the oligodendrocytes looks white to the eye. So we call it white matter. And what they are, are they are myelinated neural tracts. Gray matter, on the other hand, that's unmyelinated and it looks gray compared to the white tissue. I'm spelling that wrong. So we have unmyelinated neuron cell bodies and dendrites. So we use those terms pretty much specifically in the central nervous system. But you, even if I go back to this board here, um, you can see that this whole area, the neuron cell body and the dendrites are always unmyelinated. And they appear gray compared to, to this area um, that's myelinated, which would appear white to our eyes. <clears throat> right, um, almost finished. I'm gonna uh, finish this up with talking about neurons structural. I don't know if I'll get to functional classifications or not. So I'm just gonna write classification of neurons and that'll be talking about structural classification. This is easy, it's a nice easy topic to end on. We basically have three choices. And when I talk about structural classification, just think this is what they look like, not what they're doing, but just how they appear. And we have three choices, three categories, multipolar. This literally means the cell has three or more processes. I'll draw these after I write a few things about them. This just means one axon two or more dendrites. So that nerve cell, that motor neuron that I've been drawing would be classified as multipolar. This is the most common structural type in the human body, most common type of neuron. It's the major type in the central nervous system. Doesn't mean it does not occur in the peripheral nervous system, obviously it does, but we find most of them in the central nervous system. All right, let's move on to the second category, bipolar. You can guess where this is going. This just means the cell has two processes. That would be one axon and one dendrite. I'll draw a picture of these at the end, it's really simple. <clears throat> these are quite rare, they're not very common. We find bipolar cells, bipolar neurons in special sense organs. Specifically, we find them in the retina of the eye, so I'm just gonna write the eye. ear as well as in the sense of smell so I'm just gonna write olfaction they're typically sensory receptors <clears throat> all right um, uh, from the retina to toward this um, the uh, occipital lobe in the, in the back of the brain where we interpret what we see. So bipolar and finally unipolar. 
Sorry, I'm getting distracted. There's construction going on next door to my house. All I hear is beeping and uh, dump trucks pouring stuff out. So unipolar, this is one shared process attached to the cell body. Most of our sensory neurons are this type. Except these rare ones. Most sensory neurons in the body are unipolar. And they are found, they're, they're found in what's called ganglia clusters of bodies in the peripheral nervous system. That word ganglia means a cluster of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. If you see the word or hear the word nuclei, that means a cluster of neuron cell bodies in the central nervous system. All right, last, this is it, last bit, I promise. I'm just gonna draw these now. So number one, multipolar would, would look like this. It has, this is a typical motor neuron. So multipolar, that word just means many, actually, three or more cell processes attached to the cell body. And you can see this thing has multiple dendrites and one axon. So there's multipolar. Bipolar would look like this. There's a dendritic end, a dendrite, that goes to a cell body, and then an axon, axonal, and here's the nucleus of the cell body. So the definition of bipolar is two cell processes attached to the cell body. There's the dendritic process, there's the axon. So information would move in this direction, go toward the cell body, and then an impulse would go away from the cell body. And number three, unipolar, there's a dendritic end, it's similar to the bipolar, there's a dendritic end, but then there's one process that leads up to the cell body. And then there's an axonal side like this. And in unipolar sensory neurons in particular, information comes in this way, just like in number two. And that information, rather than going directly to the cell body like this, it goes up this shared process gets processed by the soma and then an electrical impulse heads out this way. So you can see these have many processes attached to this area. You can see that these have two, one, two attached to the cell body. And this unipolar only has one process attached to the cell body. That's what makes it unipolar. I'll start off next time with the, I didn't get to functional classifications, but I know you're probably fried. So um, I'll let you go here. Next time I'll start with functional classifications, and then we'll get on to how a nerve um, impulse, well, we'll be building up to how a nerve impulse is generated and propagated. So if you have any questions, go ahead and chime in. Um, I'm happy to answer. If you don't, then I will see you um, see you tomorrow. Have a great day, okay?